I was predestined to be seen as a monster. When I came from my mother's womb, the hospital room bore witness to a newborn with 12 fingers and 11 toes. They call this polydactyly. When I googled the term polydactyly, the browser asked, did you mean pterodactyl? By that, I'm sure I was predestined to extinction. My screams fossilized and called history as if my history could be recorded so easily. I never see people like me in the history books. Authors think as long as they mention the man with the dream and how this country eventually realized that slavery was kind of really fucked up, it's enough to satisfy the hunger in our starving belly. Some representation is better than none. At least, that's what I've always been told. I learned that when something is broken, it is to be disposed of instead of trying to fix it. In the fourth grade, I jumped out of a swing, landed wrong, dislocated my right pinky toe. When I awoke from surgery, the doctor explained to me that it was too complicated to reconstruct the bone, so they ultimately decided to take it off. Now that I only have nine toes, I guess that still makes me a monster. A monster that feels things. You see, my nerve endings are all intact. Essentially, it's as if the toe is still there, a phantom limb that still feels pain. Being this black is like being a phantom limb invisible to everyone else but me. But this, this was never supposed to be a poem about what black feels like. Shouldn't it be me standing here telling you how I was more afraid of my little sister for wanting to go to college in Baltimore because of the color of her skin and not because she's in a wheelchair and has no family that far east to look out for her? No, this shouldn't be me telling you that when I watched a seven minute video of a white cop dragging a young black girl across the grass by her hair, I couldn't help but feel her pain. As I watched him kneeling on her back for two minutes, it was my airway that started to close. This fictive kinship is what black feels like, but this, this was never supposed to be a poem about what black feels like. This was just supposed to be me telling you how I was born with an extra toe that the doctors didn't really know what to do with, so they decided to take it off because it was abnormal to them. And this is probably not normal to you. Normal is funny. You see, in the black community, extra digits are normal, functional even. To cut it off is to say one can do without, which is to say not necessary, which is to say there are parts of me not worth keeping. Thank you so much. So for those of you who have never attended a poetry slam or heard spoken word, that is a preview of what you could expect in that type of a situation in the scenario. Now, before I get started, I want to give you a little bit more background about who I am and what it is that I do. As Ben said, I grew up in Logan City, Utah. For those of you who don't know where that is, it's 90 minutes north of here. My senior year of high school, I came to Westminster College for an admitted student's day. And at that admitted student's day, I witnessed Willie Palomo, who then became my long-term mentor, friend, and teammate, speak about his experience here at Westminster. And I will never forget turning to my dad and saying, I have got to meet this guy, because Willie was doing everything I wanted to do. He was an English major, he was an activist, and he started the slam poetry team that we have here at Westminster currently today which is huge. So little did I know when Willie recruited me into doing Westminster Slam as well as just finding this place for expression that I would come to fall in love with it. And not just Westminster Slam. I fell in love with SLC's scene in general. There is a huge spoken word community that we have here and it is growing and it is the most loving place that I've ever been. But it wasn't until I went to Cupsie and Cupsy is the Collegiate Union Poetry Slam Invitational, where all of the colleges across the nation come together and do four days of the most competitive, yet loving and empowering space of poetry that you could ever possibly find yourself in. When I was at Cupsy, I heard poems about feminism, about race, social class, identity, just what it is to live 
in a space when nobody else wants you to be there. And it was in that moment that I realized I could do this too. All of these issues were things I already knew about. They were issues that I'd already seen people talk about. I was talking about them myself, but never like this. Never did I think that I could take my love for acting and my love for writing, as well as my want to be cons socially conscious and active, and bring them together. Cupsy's what started it. Cupsy also taught me that I'm really competitive. <laughs> and for that reason, I weirdly am like, yes, let's bring these things together. And then I'm going to give myself a time limit of three minutes and 10 seconds and let five random people in the audience tell me if it was worth anything. And hopefully it's more than four. Um, <laughs> and I realized with that experience that I could do something. I could take my lived experience and I could mix it with what is currently happening in conversations that we hear but I don't think we're taking in. Conversations that have happened so often, it's in one ear, out the other. So, you're probably asking yourself, why poetry? Answer is easy. I'm a college student. I don't have time to be part of these big social movements. But I do have what it takes to contribute to the dialogue and bigger conversations that are happening around me. So, that's what I started to do. Now, when I write a poem, I don't typically go into it with this thought of, let's be socially conscious and aware. In fact, it's quite opposite. Polydactyly, the poem that I opened with, that was not supposed to be a poem that was any sort of activism. That poem came about because my friend looked at me and said, you know, you haven't actually written a poem about your toe. It's kind of weird. You want to write the toe poem? You should do it. And <laughs> I said, OK. So I started, and I didn't really know where to start, so I Googled, what does it mean when you have extra digits? Like, what's the word for that? Because I didn't know. Then I found the word polydactyly. So then I Googled again solely the word polydactyly. Google quite literally said, did you mean pterodactyl? Um, <laughs> and from that, I realized I could take that and run with it as a metaphor. Not just for what this experience is, but more so what my experience is, my lived experience as a person of color. You know, pterodactyls, extinct dinosaurs, and this concept of person of color. Everybody pretends like it's too taboo to talk about, not acknowledging that the race factor is there. And then came this idea of, Okay, so the toe, let's bring that back in. Oh, yeah, I still have all of the nerve endings there. Phantom limb. Phantom limb, extinct, dinosaur, I still feel everything. Suddenly, I'm writing a poem about race. I'm writing a poem that's accessible to my audience, people that otherwise would not know any sort of this experience. And I kept writing, and I was processing things. At the time of writing this poem, there was so much violence happening in Baltimore, in Ferguson, and unfortunately, what had, had, been, had just happened in McKinney, Texas, with the pool party gone wrong. I managed to stay away from all of that for weeks, told myself I am not going to give in to watching this pain and torture and grief because I can't do anything about it. And then, one day, scrolling through my Facebook feed and I get caught by this video. And it's already playing because of the autoplay feature and I'm sucked in and I have to watch. So I do. I watch seven minutes of horror, of pain, of suffering, of just heartache. And then I have to do something about it. My poem did something about it. I started writing. I started expressing what it was to watch that, to feel that, to make it so my audience would be it, it was no longer removed. I was feeling that. I was that person. And from that moment after that, I said, okay, let's go into all of my poems, or as many of them that I can, with this concept of making art and still having it be active, activism, even if it is only 
in three minutes and 10 seconds at a time. I know that sounds like, why would you do that? Like, it's not, three minutes isn't going to do enough. And it's not. I'm very aware of that. By no means do I think that my three minutes and 10 seconds is going to fix every problem. But it will do one thing. It will spark a dialogue. It will start a conversation. It will bring a new perspective. And that is my goal. After every slam, without fail, I have won two, maybe even more people unprompted come up to me and say, thank you, I needed that. I've never thought of it this way. Even since just writing that poem, I have had more people come up to me and say, I'm polydactyl, or my daughter's polydactyl. They're going to love this because it's an abnormality that people don't talk about. So, I want to take a second and ask you something. What is an issue or a cause that you care about deeply? And while you think about that, I also want you to think about how do you best like to receive information? What is your favorite form of media? Do you like to watch videos, read articles? Maybe you like to feel it through dance. Maybe you like to hear it from somebody else's story. Maybe you're an academic and you like to read about it and look at all the citations and keep reading even more. That's not me. <laughs> That's why I do what I do. <laughs> but I want to invite you as my audience to, as we move forward, think of ways how you can benefit the conversation that is happening surrounding the issue or topic that you care about. And I want you to come at it from a perspective that is of your own self, reflective. What is your lived experience? How is that aiding to a bigger picture? And how can you start a dialogue? And when I say dialogue, I don't mean with your friends or people that have the same political views as you, or maybe different if you like to argue on Facebook. I mean, if you were in a room of strangers and this topic was brought up, what could you bring to the table that is unique and different than what somebody else is already saying? And that is where this starts. Taking these two concepts and making them active. I'm doing it with poetry. I'm not doing it by myself, though. There are hundreds of poets that are doing this. There are hundreds of academics that are doing this. There are hundreds of storytellers that are doing this. And I want you to do this. So I want to close you out with a poem. And the reason I want to close you out with this poem is because it took me a very, very long time to write this poem because I had everybody else's views, everybody else's thoughts, everybody else's opinions on it, that I couldn't come up with my own. It took sitting in a coffee shop with my slam master to come up with an idea of what I wanted to say in this poem. And then, after coming up with that idea, sitting on it for an entire month and a half, knowing full well I was going to competition, getting to competition, day of the bout, not having a poem written, saying, no, I'm not going out to eat with y'all, I need to write this poem an hour before we're about to perform it, to write it. But it was worth it, because I had finally gotten the words, finally figured out how I interpreted it, and finally made it my experience. So I'm going to share this poem with you, and after, I would encourage you to keep the dialogue going. Welcome to the after party. All of the big names are here tonight. Mike Brown is taking shots with Trayvon, who just put Skittles in to spike the sweet tea. Eric Garner is enjoying the taste of air as he buys rounds at the oxygen bar. Sandra doesn't worry about signaling before she merges onto the dance floor. Rakia Boyd is up next for karaoke. And she's waiting for us to say her name. Tanisha Anderson and Natasha McKenna have their hands up, but only because the DJ is playing their jam. And Freddie, Freddie Gray is standing in the corner, no longer paralyzed by fear. I'm afraid we've reached the capacity of this poem. 
This list is too long. It's getting crowded. If you would like to enter this party, please have your hashtag ready to show at the door. Thank you.